As for the woman uh, styling herself mother, Teresa, I can attest that until I wrote my little pamphlet, she had uh, been the recipient, the beneficiary, of a 25-year Niagara of 100% favorable publicity in every secular, Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic, or non-religious outlet of any kind at all in the media. Only by the grace of my intervention could it not be said, <laughs> could it not be said when she died that no one had ever said a single word against her. <laughs> both Christopher Hitchens and Mother Teresa had one thing in common. They both professed to have something in common with regard to the poor. They both said they were concerned about the poor. Unlike Mr. Hitchens, Mother Teresa actually did something about the poor. So she... That was my next guest and the deceased journalist Christopher Hitchens debating Mother Teresa, which they did many times. As she is poised to be declared a saint by Pope Francis at the top of September, old criticisms of Mother Teresa are being revived. My next guest has launched a preemptive strike on any who would disparage her legacy or sanctity. He is Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic League and author of the new book, Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. Welcome to the program, Bill Donahue. Why write a book like this on the eve of Mother Teresa's canonization? I mean, talking about her critics, why not just celebrate her? Well, I think we should celebrate her, and that's just it, though. The guy who passed away, Christopher Hitchens, he was my sparring buddy. We had mm. many a fights. At least he was fun to fight with. Uh, he was wrong on just about everything, what he said about her. Mm. But, but after Christopher died in 2011, uh, other people sort of emerged, maybe not of the same stature. Mm. And knowing what the media are like, they always like to be the contrarian. So if Mother Teresa is so great, and she was, in fact, voted the most admired person right. in the 20th century over Martin Luther King, Billy Graham, John Paul II, and other stellar people, uh, you just know there's going to be the contrarian element. Well, let's see, maybe she's not all that good. And then we can kind of revisit all the criticisms of her. They are so unfair, and that's why I wrote this book. There's a Dr. Arup Chatterjee that you introduced me to. I'd never right. heard of this guy, right. who's, uh, you mentioned at the top of the book, he is really the guy who got the ball started on this kind of anti-Mother Teresa narrative that persists even to this day. We'll get into some of the more recent critiques. Who is he? Who well, is he's, this Dr. He's, he's, a, he's an Indian physician. And he was upset with her because she gave Calcutta, his hometown, a bad name. Now, just think of the logic here. There's a lot of destitute people in Calcutta for all kinds of different reasons. She goes there. She leaves the sisters of Loretto to go there. She wants to tend to the poor, the dispossessed. And because she does that, and she becomes discovered because of Malcolm Mug Muggeridge, a BBC right. reporter, then Calcutta becomes associated with destitution. It's almost like as if she, they're blaming her yeah. for the reputation instead of heralding her for doing what she could to help these poor people. I mean, it, it, the, the logic is, is, is so irrational. But that's also true of the other critics as well. Right. Well, you talked about Christopher Hitchens, whom yes. I knew. He was here sure. in D.C. Uh, poor Christopher died of, of cancer. But he was so... It was a, almost a blind hatred of Mother Teresa. What was it? What, what unites all of these critics? And what do you think drove... Well, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. You know, I started this thing uh, really over the winter because I've been debating him for a long time. I've yeah. had rallies in the support of Mother Teresa and the like. So I had something invested in it. Uh, quite frankly, there, there are two salient characteristics that are, are true of all of her most severe critics. Number one, they are militant atheists, not just atheists, militant atheists. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they regard Catholicism as if it were some kind of a hate speech. Number two, they're all far on the left. I didn't say liberal. Far on the left, socialist, and I can explain to you if you want mm -hmm. as to why would a socialist be upset with her? Yeah, why? Why? Why, why, why would they take At issue first, with it her? wasn't She's exactly the poor. And well, see, that's just it. In the socialist mentality, that's the job of the state, and they make it very clear. She's interfering with. They accused her of interfering with the job of government to take care of the poor, as if the government's done a great job. They mm -hmm. typically create dependency. By the way, she wasn't against the idea of the government stepping right. into helping the poor. What she wanted was that old Catholic way of doing things, one-on-one, -on -one, a face relationship mm -hmm. between the person who's the helper and the person whom you're helping. Yeah. But they resented the fact that she was also an altruist. As a matter of fact, they regard altruism as a myth. So here we have this nun who doesn't draw attention to herself. 
She's motivated by Catholicism. She's interfering with the statist idea of helping the poor, and she believes in God. I mean, this is just too much for the atheist and the socialist to bear. Uh -huh. And that's what that's the uniting cord for all of these uh, critics of her. I yeah, know. I knew Mother Teresa. I, I followed her around many many times. Did some pieces on her. Interviewed her. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman. How anybody can say there was not sanctity in this woman. She was not beautiful to look at, but boy, was she radiant and beautiful to be with. Um, I want to get into some of the criticisms sure. because these have been around for a long time, Bill. Right. They didn't just crop up. One is Mother Teresa took all these huge donations, millions and millions of dollars from people like Charles Keating, uh, Baby Doc uh, Javalier, Devalier. Uh, I'm going to read something you have in your book. This comes from uh, Murray Kempton, who writes... The swindler Charles Keating gave her $1.2 million, most dubiously his own to give, and she rewarded him with the personalized crucifix he doubtless found of sovereign use as an ornamental camouflage for his pirate flag. Is that what we have here? A woman who took money, she, didn't, she had no regard for whom she took it from, and does that in any way degrade her? Look, in her look, if, if you are poor, and you're suffering, it. You're, you're suffering from malnutrition, and most of the world's leaders are despots, and if some of those despots are going to give you some money, and you take the money not to go on a fast weekend to Vegas, you're not going on the cruise, you know, you're taking the money to give to the poor so you can build the hospices, the, the, the leper settlements and the like, mm -hmm. what in the world, why wouldn't she do something of that nature? And by the way, Robert Maxwell, the publisher, he right. was a crook. Charles Keating, uh, the financier, right. he was a crook. She had the money spent before it was exposed that these guys were crooks. So what is she supposed to do? Go back and try and get the money from the mouths of the poor to give it back to them? See, they never tell you that. They leave it out. That's why I wrote this book too, Raymond, because they leave out these central facts. If you find out after the fact that the money is spent that the guy was a crook, what are you supposed to do with that? Yeah, it's, not, gonna, it's not it's giving not like moral if, sanction to what they did. Absolutely not. It's just not like as if, well, I know you're a crook and give me some money, Al Capone. You know what yeah, I mean? Right, <laughs> That's what right. they make it well, out there's to also a Catholic teaching of giving alms to expiate yes. your sins. Right. And maybe she saw, maybe she did know what she was dealing with up front with some of these people and saw that as a charitable act. She's helping the poor. She's not enriching herself. Now, this brings up another criticism. Mm -hmm. Some say, look, she, she collected millions upon millions of dollars and look at the conditions of these homes and these institutions and these hospices that she created. They say uh, they were cramped conditions, they, that the, the beds were too close together, they weren't given the, the top flight of care and medicines that some of these people might have gotten. Your answer would be what? Well, I think the most severe critics on this are Serge Larravee and two other Canadians. Mm. Uh, they, 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 there are three professors out of the University of Montreal in Ottawa who made that charge most specifically. And they're saying that uh, they quote a Dr. Robin Fox, who went over there and talked about the lousy hygiene. Well, I had to pay $3,000 to get the article translated. It's not translated from yeah. the French to the English to look right. at their work. Then I went to pay more money to get the work of Fox. All, a lot of stuff is untranslated, but I got a hold of it because I'm determined to get to it. Guess what? Fox said just the opposite of what they said. In other words, the Canadians lied. I didn't say they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. When you lie, it means you know the truth. I know what this guy Fox said. He commended her for the hygiene that they had mm -hmm. there, just the opposite of what they said. And yes, no doubt, sometimes you're going to have tough quarters. If you have people dying of diseases because the hospitals won't accept them, Okay, they literally won't accept them. You have children who've survived abortions. You have the These malnourished. People in the streets. Yeah, I mean, people they, in they the were streets. Fall, their bodies are falling yeah, apart. Yeah, what do they think it is? The Waldorf Astoria? Of course it wasn't. I mean, she didn't make no pretense to be that. Then they weren't after because she lived an ascetic lifestyle as well. One critic said that she didn't go and in, wasn't involved in the intellectual and artistic life of Calcutta, <laughs> as if she should go to the opera as opposed to dealing with these. I mean, some of the critics are really, you know, yeah, yeah, they're, way, they're, way out there. Yeah, they're, they're stretching it. Way out there. Well, one of the things that I loved, I mean, if, if anyone who knows the missionaries of charity, whether they're in New York or San Francisco or Calcutta or wherever they are, they live with the people they serve. Mm -hmm. They're there. And they've got the same hygiene, the same living conditions. They wash their saris. They hang them up that night. They put them on again. It's a very austere life of prayer and service. And they don't confuse the two. It really is a, a, a You know, it's interesting, too. Amazing. There was one atheist who worked with her, uh, Celeste Owen Jones. Mm -hmm. She's a former Catholic. And she's uh, uh, a, a pro-abortion. She's very clear about it. Mm -hmm. But she said, I looked at what she did. I went there. 
and saw what was happening, unlike Christopher Hitchens, unlike the Canadians who never mm -hmm. interviewed anybody who worked there or worked or for her. her. Yeah. She saw what was happening, and she said, my God, the woman really is a saint, even though I can't really believe in saints and miracles anymore. But if there ever was a saint, it's Mother Teresa. And she says, the only thing I can think of as to why she would give up her life for these people, because she's so determinedly pro-life. Mm. Because if you're pro-life with the unborn, it's an easy thing to say that you're going to be in favor of helping people. That's why I don't like this canard from some social justice people that if you are pro-life, you don't care about the poor. Nobody cares more about the poor than the pro-life people, let me tell you. Mm. I want to change gears for a moment. There's another issue that Chris Hitchens would mention all the time. He, he, and I heard it myself, he would say, Mother Teresa is a ghoul. She's obsessed with death. She's sadistic. She's got the home for the dying in Calcutta, and she, she loves to watch these people get very ill and die. You would say what? He went beyond that. So did the Canadians. They, so she would say, listen, I understand redemptive suffering. Mm. They don't understand Christ, and they don't understand redemption. The idea of redemptive suffering, as James Hitchcock, the great Catholic historian, says, is probably the most radical idea in history. Right. The idea that I can unite my sufferings to Christ. Now, one does not have to believe that. I believe it. You believe it. Catholics believe it. It's a radical conception. But why would you mock somebody? Why would you ridicule somebody who said, I can understand the sufferings of these poor, destitute, dispossessed people, and I'm uniting my sufferings? At the same time, when she went through her dark moments, she felt the same way. Instead, that they do, they look down their nose, they're smug and arrogant, these mm. critics of Mother Teresa. You go down the line, and you mentioned so many here in, the, in unmasking Mother Teresa's critics. Uh, there's a new story that has hit since this book went to press, and it's Hindu fundamentalists who are coming out now in the Indian parliament, and they're saying, Mother Teresa, she was really involved in a conversion scheme. The service <laughs> was an opportunity to bring people right, in right. in weakened circumstances and convert them to Christianity. Right, right. She gave them a pill to make them sicker so she could convert them. Well, I mean, this is absolutely astonishing. You know, I, 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 there's nothing I won't believe anymore from these people. They always are searching, and I keep, like, they're, they're running like a moving target, so you knock down this thing. The care was no good. She didn't believe in this. And, and they just keep making it up. I mean, she was there to help people. She didn't ask. When she went to New York City to, to open up the first hospice for the AIDS patients, she didn't go around and ask them, by the way, are you Catholic, Protestant, Jewish? Do you believe in nothing? Mm -hmm. She was there to help them out. And then she was ridiculed for that as well, because they say she objected because she didn't want a public, uh, in a public building, she didn't want an elevator. They didn't point out that she said we would take the people, the handicapped, up the stairs ourselves, the sisters. Mm. But they don't, see, they left that out of it. They want to make it sound like as if she wanted to make them suffer. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you tell the truth about Mother Teresa, you will wind up as I did. I loved her before I wrote this book. I love her doubly now. Well, they, and they also have used even her postulator's book, which talks about, well, you see all those letters where she talks about the dark night of the soul that went on for 40 years, mm -hmm. a long time. And in that dark night, she doubted, she wrestled with, she didn't feel or was, wasn't able to sense Christ's presence, God's presence in her life. Her critics say, aha, we have proof. She yeah. didn't believe. She didn't even believe in the Eucharist to hold so dear. You would <laughs> my, say, well, my, my poor friend Christopher Hitchens, uh, uh, at least I'm not talking behind his back and he's passed away, yeah. but I told him many times to his face what a fraud he was, you know. Mm. Um, and, 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 and in this regard here, I mean, he knows better, or, or maybe he doesn't. I said, look, there's a profound difference between feeling Jesus and believing in Jesus. Mm. We don't always feel his presence. She never stopped believing. How do we know? She was a daily communicant. Yeah. I mean, we know that. The reverence that she showed to Jesus is unquestioned. The fact that she had some dark moments of wondering whether she really felt Jesus' presence is an entirely mm -hmm. different conception. Mm -hmm. By the way, on Hitchens, i got to say this much, because yeah. he started this whole nonsense. He did. He wrote a 99-page book about it. As I told him right to his face several times on television and in formal debates, if you were a student of mine, I'd give you an F, and I'll tell you why. Because you didn't have one end note, one footnote, one no bibli bibliography, no attribution whatsoever. Now, if you want to take on the most serious person of the 20th century and say everybody else's idea of her is wrong, I'm okay with that. Prove that they're wrong. When you give me no proof, no evidence whatsoever, I have more footnotes in my book than I have pages, okay? And that's why I like working with Sophia Institute Press, Charlie McKinney, guy doesn't get enough credit, 
Nora Malone, the editor. People should need to know more about Sophia Institute Press. They will do it the right way because they're interested in scholarship. Christopher was busy having a few extra, and he wouldn't. He wasn't bothered with with, with scholarship. So that's why I told him. I said, "You you're not you're entitled to your unsupported opinions, but don't expect me as a scholar to give it any credence." Do you think the canonization will wash away so many of these critics, or does it? Does it force them to double down? And they say, this is the Vatican trying to put a happy face on a woman who opposed female empowerment, was opposed to abortion, and, and, and was really very countercultural. I, I, I don't think it'll go away altogether, because I think that these people have a vested interest in trying to bring her down. And, you know, Christopher brought up that argument, too, as, as well as the Canadians. She should have been pro-abortion, even though Christopher himself personally was pro-life. Pro There's a contradiction yeah. there. But uh, she needed to empower women. That's how you get rid of poverty. Well, let's see now. If abortion is the way to empower women, then China should have a lot of free women. Why do they have the highest female suicide rate in the world? Mm. Because up until recently, they were told to abort their children. That's why. And according to that logic, if you have more abortion, you have less mouths to feed, why not practice infanticide? Why not kill all the kids who are one, two, and three years of age? You have all that many less mouths to feed, and then we can declare, see that with the champions of the poor. These people are malicious, and they're illogical. Why do you think they were so determined to bring her down? Is it because she was such an icon and loomed so large in the minds of the secular world as well as the Catholic world? I think whenever you touch on the subject of altruism, the seculars get nervous because it's typically associated with a person who's religiously motivated. Mm. Now, here you get this woman who never sought the limelight. It came to her. Mm. And they're trying to say, listen, you know, part of it is, is, is just this human uh, idea that if you make it too big, we'll take you down. Michael Phelps just had a tremendous run at the Olympics. I'm reading all these articles why he's not the greatest swimmer of all time. He's not the greatest <laughs> athlete of all time. I mean, look, why is America hated? Because we're number one. So I guess you have to go through that. The Catholic Church is hated because as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what people say. We are, in fact, the Cadillac of all religions, all right? I mean, <laughs> some people don't want to say that. I just did. So if you want to go after the Cadillac, you're going to go after the Catholic Church. She's at the, she's at the epicenter. She drives the Cadillac, okay, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lot of things for your buck there. You, know, you, you can really smack at her, go against altruism, go against the Catholic Church, go against the idea of helping the poor. Sure. I want to talk about Macy's. You have oh. been locked in a battle with Macy's for the last few months. Uh, this is about a detective, Javier Chavez. Yes. Who is called to a woman's bathroom. Tell us what happened and why you're so exercised about this. You're, you're issuing a press release yeah. a week. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give up on this. And people need to understand what's at stake here. You had a situation. Let me tell you about a, an African-American woman here about five years ago. She was working for Macy's, and they had these men. They're cross-dressers. They, they, they call them transgender people. They're cross-dressing men. And they go into the woman's bathroom, and she objected. And uh, Macy's said, well, if you're not going to enforce the policy, we're going to fire you. And they did. Now, what makes this case even more interesting to me, Javier Chavez, this guy is in Flushing, New York, here a couple of months ago in May, and uh, a woman and her daughter see a, a man and a woman in the woman's room. They come out and they make, make a complaint. This security guard then has one of his deputies go and investigate. In fact, the man was in there, and they said, get out. If you want to use the men's room, use the men's room. Next thing you know, he lodges a complaint, all right? And then they bring in Chavez. They say, didn't you know that Macy's has a policy that men can use the woman's room if they declare themselves to be a woman? He said, I didn't know this. Hmm. Then they brought him back a second time. He said, no, I, I got it. I understand that. And he says, as a Catholic, I can't go along with it. But, and this is the important thing that hmm. the viewers should understand. He said, if that's your policy, I will enforce it. There was no insubordination like arguably there was with, with the African-American woman. Mm -hmm. He's called in a day or two later, and he's fired. He's fired for his beliefs, not because he refused to do his job. He's, this, these, this is the Macy's thought police. The, the man was fired for entertaining a thought, a belief that Macy's objected to. The thought was a man should use the men's room. This is, I mean, we know the society is spinning out of control in many respects, but this mega giant, Macy's, the boldness of these people, that this, now, this is going to be, it, it's being before the, uh, 
uh, the, the courts and the, the, an administrative uh, situation uh, in New York City. They're going to go through the human rights thing. Raymond Nardo mm -hmm. is a great uh, uh, Long Island uh, uh, attorney who's representing Mr. Chavez. Mm -hmm. But the people need to know about this. And if you go to our website, you'll see the information where you can contact Macy's about now, this. Now, some would say, Bill, right. if a man wants to work at Macy's, whether he's a Catholic or not, if he can't abide by their policies, and if his religious beliefs are so uh, prohibitive to those policies, then he can't do that job. Well, would say that, what? I'd say this. Listen, at the Catholic League, we have people who work in the policy section. They're all committed Catholics. I have had in the past mm -hmm. people dealing with the accounting section and the processing section who are not Catholic. As long as they were not oppositional to the church teachers, what would I care? Now, what if I met a guy who was working as in the accounting area, in the processing uh, of, the, of the membership? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, I got a sister. She's a lesbian and whatnot. And I, I personally, I guess I've come around. I'm not... I'm not wild about it, but I'm okay with two men getting married. I'm not going to fire him because I have more tolerance and respect for the fact that this guy can still do his job. He's not interfering with the Catholic League's end, the front end of getting the stuff mm -hmm. out there. So what? See now, if Macy's, if this guy said to Macy's, "I'm not going to do the job, and I have my religious convictions," that would be an interesting. But he didn't case. say that. He didn't say that. He said, "I will enforce the policy," but. I'm entitled to my point of view, and they say, no, you, you're not allowed to think the way you want to think if it's against the way we think. That's thought control. That's totalitarian. Got to get to this before I let you go. Earlier this week in Oklahoma City at the Civic Center, a mm -hmm. publicly owned facility, right. a guy who's done this before conducted a black mass, a satanic mass, in his words. Uh, I won't get all, into all the details. They're pretty graphic and nasty. Uh, the bishop there decided, Archbishop Coakley, we're just having a prayer rally. We're going to have a march. That's it. You were kind of restrained on this issue. Why? Well, because I think Archbishop Coakley did a fine job in 2014 with the same man as a registered sex yeah. offender. Mm -hmm. um, the there's something wrong going on here. And uh, I'm going to follow the lead. Uh, I'm not here to jump in front of the bishops. I'm here to support the bishops. And, if that, and I think Coakley is a responsible archbishop. And... Uh, this guy was looking for a grandstand. You see, we, we can't yeah, always What is give... he trying to do here? He... I mean, explain to people what well, he's, he's trying to he's do. Trying to my get... estimation, he's, he's... this isn't... He's not trying to revive the satanic faith. No. He's trying to test the limits of for the First Amendment right, free speech, well, that's... and religious and, tolerance, and, 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 right? And he's intentionally trying to insult us, which is why he chose on Monday the 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, mm -hmm. to do this little act here. Look, the First Amendment by the founders, when they understood this... Free speech was a means toward an end, the good society. It wasn't an end in and of itself. What is the purpose of what he's doing here? There's no, there's no end to the good society and something of this nature. And if, if you, on public grounds, if I can't put a nativity scene because people say, oh, I object to that, those taxpayers, many of them are Catholic. Why should they be forced to pay for, for, for a, a, an event of hate speech which has nothing to do with political discourse in, in the civic arena. No, the, 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 it's not just the authorities there in Oklahoma City who dropped the ball. This whole country doesn't think correctly about freedom in the First Amendment in many, many different ways. Bill Donahue, the book is Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. We thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics by Bill Donahue is available at bookstores everywhere and online. It's also available as an e-book. And before we go, last week I told you about the remake of the Oscar-winning first-century epic Ben-Hur and chatted with producers Mark Burnett and Roma Downey. It opens August 19th in the U.S. That chariot ride is worth the price of admission. And as summer winds down, I'm hearing such great things from readers of Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls. While I was traveling last week, one reader sent me his book report, including pictures. This made my week. I love that the young and young at heart are taking the trip to Perilous Falls and finding much more than adventure there. It's also a great way to prepare for the second book of the Will Wilder series, which premieres next March.